All right. So welcome to the Honey Badger Radio, Radio Impromptu Airplay Recap Stream. We're with uh, Girl White Swat, who's recently from the Hell's Kitchen. Oh. <laughs> where uh, <laughs> the, the hottest place on earth where apparently they decided to hold this So event. welcome to the Honey oh, Patcher Radio, oh, Radio Impromptu up, up. <laughs> I am so sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure where that came from. Uh, probably from me. No, yeah, it didn't come uh, from me. Girl White's what? Who's recently... Okay, who's got the... Who's got the... Yeah, the open. Allison, who has it open? Who has it open? The, the hottest place on earth where apparently they decided to hold this. Oh, well, okay, here it is. is. Uh, I've got got this radio radio. <laughs> okay. Wow. There we go. It's fixed. I have heat stroke. Uh. <laughs> okay. I thought that was only the. Never mind. Wow, Karen. You had one job. I have I a love lot you guys. Thank you very much. So. Well, you did the other job as rather well. So. I did them in very horrible conditions. Yes. Okay, who else do we have with us today? The lovely Panina. Hey. Hi, hey guys. How you doing? And, and I've been... Her friend... And I've been the terrible appears. I've been the terrible. The terrible. <laughs> yes. And so, could you guys tell us a little bit about uh, how things were from your perspective? Just seeing things as they are, because I have no idea where Allison has gone to. I don't know. I think I think she's trying to. Think the... No, I'm 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 here. Oh, okay. okay. So, I am just... here. I've just been trying to to figure out what was going on, so I closed every single window except for this one. And, it was Karen. And then I found out that it was still going on, so it was very mysterious. All right, so it was both. So that's the solution. It was you. <laughs> right. You were the fly in the ointment. Okay. Well, um, I thought I thought that it, it went it it had a good start. Um, Ash Scow and um, Mark Seb. Mark. Yeah. Mark Seb and uh, Alan Bakari did took the morning uh, shift on the Gamer Day panel, and there were two. Um, sort of journalism experts and uh, a game developer named Derek Smart um, sitting on the other side and uh, he describes himself as a neutral, he's, he's not an anti um, but very much just like yeah this whole thing's just kind of been blown out of proportion kind of guy. Um, anyhow it was it was actually quite good in, in the uh, in the morning um, and uh, just a lot of, um, and anybody can watch the stream, it's, it was just a lot of, uh, sort of reasonable discussion. Um, then, then we moved into the afternoon and uh, I think Milo may have annoyed um, Koretz, uh, Koretsky, Koretsky. Koretsky. The, the moderator and because uh, uh, he can be quite arrogant, he can come off as a little bit arrogant which he usually gets away with, but sometimes I, I think it gets people's backs up. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, essentially uh, that was when Koretsky sort of came down hard on uh, things that people were saying, and they, he, he was essentially, well, but we're not talking about feminism, but we're not talking about gender, you know, we're, that, we're not talking about that, we're talking about Gamergate, and I'm like, <laughs> like, how, how do you separate the motive, like, how do you, like, you want to know why, all of this bullshit happened, right? All of this bullshit happened because there's a very, very easy narrative, and it's the root of every single hysteria, right, that has ever happened um, in the media. Everything from, from vaccines to, you know, campus rape hysteria to uh, the, the satanic uh, child care, daycare scandals and all of that is threats of harm to women or children. Right, really captures the imagination. I mean, you got a threat of harm to women, or you, you even have things like like mass killings of men and boys in places like Bosnia, right? Like where they they essentially uh, they they 
will just separate out all the men and all the boys over the age of like 12 or 14, shoot them all and bury them in mass graves, and all of the women and children, they just get sent away, you know, just get out. And, uh, and what's the story the media wants to focus on is the, uh, the suffering and the struggles of these women and children who are marching, you know, doing like a march across the mountains. This is what sells. This is the narrative that sells stories. It's the narrative that sells newspapers. It's the narrative that gets everybody excited about, you know, and, and upset and wanting to read more. And that's why it's been, number one, it's been so easy to convince the public um, that this is the whole story, right? Is that Zoe Quinn and Brianna Wu and Anita Sarkeesian get threats and they get harassment. Um, that's the whole thing. That's the entire thing. Um, and, and why? Well, they say it's because these guys hate women and they don't want women in gaming. And we're just going to take their word for it because that sounds like what a bunch of, you know, people who would like to play GTA 5 would be like, right? Um, and, and that's as deep as they look, right? And it's because that narrative, that sort of damsel in distress narrative is so seductive. And you can't separate that from what happened. You just can't. There's no way to talk about Gamergate without talking about gender. Even if you're not an anti-feminist, even if you don't want to talk about um, what aspects of, of you know, feminist critique you want to keep out of games, even if you're all one of these Gamergaters who says it's only about ethics and journalism, it's not about you know, feminism, uh, feminist critique of games. That's not what it's about, at least not to me. Uh, is what a lot of people would say. You still have to look at what the press took and ran with, right? And you still have to concede that that is a massive part of the problem. And for the entire half of the the panel, the second half of the panel discussion, Koretsky really did not want to look at that at all, right? At all. And the the media, the journalism experts were saying, well, but there just wouldn't seem to be a story in it for me. And I'm thinking, how could there not be a story? How could there not be a story in this? Just in a, a human interest story in how people behave. Like, do people think that the the uh, the daycare scandals, the the satanic ritual ritual abuse daycare scandals, that there that there was no story in that after everybody realized it was bunk, right? That there was just no story there. Um, that 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 taking a look at why we did that, why the media bought it, why the media just kept on reporting it as if it was fact, why the media kept hyping the fear, you know, and, and kept pushing the story and pushing the story in the specific way that they pushed it. Lots of people have, people have written books about how and why that happened, right? There is a story there, right? And if journalists, real journalists, aren't willing to look at that story, then I just think that that's a shame. It really is. We have to try and figure out why journalists do these things. I, I have no doubt that a lot of journalists think that they're really good people. And, you know, that the woman who did the ABC Nightline story on Nita Sarkeesian and what it feels like to be a Gamergate target, um, I think that she thinks that she was doing a really good human interest story. Right? We have to actually be able to talk about why somebody could, who did such a botched job of a story and so obviously biased of, of a story could think that they are doing a good story. So that, that's essentially what I, I was really, 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 really frustrated at this idea that we have to discuss Gamergate on this panel without discussing gender and without in discussing the, the positive impact of gender and the narrative around gender on how this story turned into the fiasco that it is. So okay. that's my, my feeling. Let me just interject something. So what they're saying is that, or, or what this particular person is, is positing, I'm not even going to attempt his, her name or his name. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know what? I'm not even going to bother because you know that it'll come out sounding like I'm choking on a hairball. Um, well, we love what, to I know you guys love to trip me up, especially the people who send emails. Yes. Love to, yeah. But um, what I wanted to say is this. So 
Gamergate or gamers in general, when they when they started this consumer revolt, they weren't the ones who brought gender into the the subject. No, no, the, you, they were not the ones. The 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 media was the were the ones who brought gender into the subject, and now saying. So we, they yeah, were the, really talking about Zoe Quinn, but if you're going to say that that's about gender, then um, then we need a men's rights movement to make sure Anthony Weiner doesn't get harassed and, and belittled online for his indiscretions, right? Um, it's not about gender. It's, it's about the salaciousness of sexual liaisons, particularly when there may be favors changing hands. Right. Yeah, well, but the thing is that gender may not have been what this was about. It was about ethics and journalism, but theory, this, this concept, concept of gender in this narrative is what was used as the weapon to silence the yeah. argument. Absolutely. It was, it was essentially, it was essentially uh, an example of the games media saying, people are saying we're corrupt. Oh my god, look over there, a woman's being harassed. Everybody look! This, this is exactly what I, 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 I say when we start talking about the, the slut-shaming narrative. This is the cover for any time uh, um, there's a discussion where they don't want to talk about somebody's inappropriate or dysfunctional or, or, or otherwise harmful to other people behavior, they use accusations of harassment, accusations of sexism, accusations of slut-shaming, anything that they can take and turn it into a discussion about gender in order to distract from what is actually going on. It's just a distraction tactic. That's all that it is. Well, yeah. And, but the other thing is that it's a distraction tactic, yeah, and it works. But in order to have these conversations that need to be, have, to be had, the, the journalism cannot have this gun to point, point at people. And it's essentially all it is is the person who can get up on the highest podium with the loudest megaphone and scream misogynist with the most volume is the one who essentially is the morally correct in, in the argument. Well, that, that's, that's ridiculous. Uh, and it actually sounds like the, the argument there that, that, that was being turned on Gamergate was that it's all right for, for these people to use um, allegations of sexism, you use allegations of uh, slut-shaming and things like that to, to gender the discussion, but then you can't talk about how feminist ideology is being used to, to falsely gender the discussion as a distraction tactic. So you basically can't talk about what's happening in the discussion in order to have the discussion. Well, yeah. I, would, I, would, I would qualify that with... It's not just feminist rhetoric. It's no, simply, it's simply woman is victim rhetoric. Because it's not just feminists who employ it. Because I, I, I'm guaranteeing that there would be conservative outlets who would jump on this bandwagon that were against gaming, who would jump on this bandwagon that gaming is, 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 is uh, gamers somehow hurt women through their oh, mind sure. ways. You know, but it's, the, it's, uh, but the, the, the terminology that they use, the buzzwords, are feminist-created buzzwords. And they, the more buzzwords they can throw in there, the harder it becomes to have the discussion. So I had this conversation with um, someone on Twitter who said that it's, it's really about just ethics in, in gaming. And I, I said that it's also, in, in my opinion, it's about demilitarizing culture. Because if you have a if you have a group of people who can point these huge guns at anyone's head who criticizes them, then there's no fair exchange and there's no ability to enact ethics in journalism. I mean, how do you enact ethics against somebody who is like an, an AK-47 is currently shooting you? You can't. You have no power to do it. You have to have a, a demilitarization of culture. You have to ha have a a uh, putting down these weapons that people are using to shoot people with. And first you have having to a conversation. Weapons. Sorry? First you have to convince people, not just the people using them, but other people, that they they are actually offensive weapons. They're, they're not defensive weapons. They're not shields. They're not protection. They're offensive weapons. Well, yeah, I would, and I would say that they're definitely not shields and not protection because in order to use women as an offensive or as a weapon like this in this narrative, you actually have to emphasize their victimhood over their personhood. Well, and on top of that, it also requires uh, completely ignoring or pretending 
uh, the non-existence of women like me, women like Panina, women like you guys, that uh, that those women don't exist. If they do exist, they're bad people. Um, you know, it, it or or they're double victims because they're victims of their own feelings about the subject. Um, it's it's just it's really toxic. Well, yeah, it is very toxic, and I would say that the demilitarization of culture that I'm talking about would not just not just help rational discourse and help consumer move movements like Gamergate, who have to basically storm the machine gun nest and and be subject to these this 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 barrage of enemy fire, which you know every bullet has misogyny written on it, but also it would help women to to defy that narrative that they are primarily defined by being victims rather than or as women they're defined primarily by being victims rather than their personal choices and actions and this is this is the thing this is what got kicked me got me kicked out of Calgary Expo uh, maybe I'm belaboring that point but that specific point of view and yeah. this is what people don't want to talk about they don't want to talk about the de the ne necessity of the demilitarization of culture and they don't want to talk about the fact that this isn't what we're doing now turning women into weapons, weaponized damsels, is not healthy for women either. But let's let's get back to, to, to airplay. So um, I noticed uh, you want to tell us a bit more about what happened at airplay after, I know we had a long, we've had a long discussion about how um, airplay or uh, Gamergate, people who say that Gamergate are just about ethics and journalism are missing the fact that as long as Get, as journalists have this gun to point their head, point at anybody's head, they can silence any criticism. Gamer can't perspectives are about ethics in, in journalism. Gamergate, on the whole, would not have existed without that narrative, that you hate women narrative. You just want, you know, you, you're just slut shaming Zoe Quinn, right? You're, you just, you, you, and then you released her nudes. That was an invasion of privacy, right? When she publicly posted the, her professionally done nudes on the internet and people were just sharing links, right? If that hadn't happened, if, if, this, if this examination of an improper relationship or a suspected improper relationship between Nathan Grayson, was it? Yes. And Zoe Quinn, if it had just amounted to a discussion of, an, of a potentially improper relationship that might have led to um, to her getting positive attention and opportunities that maybe sh people didn't feel she deserved, right? Um, if it had just stayed that discussion, right, it would have fizzled out just like every other discussion in about games media ethics. It would have just fizzled out, right? And people would have gone back to baseline because, you know, uh, so people are paying, you know, uh, reviewers with $2,500 gaming laptops and, you know, trips to Disneyland or whatever, right? Um, so people are giving uh, the Indie Game Awards to, to their, you know, best friend's boyfriend or whatever, right? Um, yeah, that just That stuff just happens, right? But the intensity of the counterattack, the the intensity of the silencing of discussion, right? The the blanket nature of it. I I think that Gamergate. I think that there were several points where Gamergate would have fizzled, and one of them uh, was precluded by uh, Reddit deleting that massive massive thread that had something like twenty thousand comments. Right, and they deleted pretty much the entire discussion thread. That got everybody really, really riled up, and got everybody interested again. And then, uh, 4chan banning discussion of the Five Guys Burgers and Fries thing, the Zoe Quinn, the Quinn conspiracy, all of that. When when 4chan went and said, "Yeah, no, you can't discuss this here." Right? Everybody looked at it and they thought, this isn't just games journalists, right? This is actually uh, Reddit admins, you know, where you can speak your mind on the internet. And this is 
fucking fortune. Fortune, B-tards, the fucking B-tards, right? And and we can't have a discussion about this. Like, we share the most disgusting jokes with each other every day. We post pictures of people with things shoved up their butts that you don't even want to imagine could go up anybody's butt. We we do any and and our motto is we offend everybody and that gets rid of the sissies, right? And they won't allow discussion of it, right? Because she's a woman. And talking about it is misogyny? That's what really put this thing in swing. Because none of that was misogyny. None of it was fucking misogynistic at all. And to be accused of that, right, that you're a misogynistic shitlord troll who lives in his mother's basement, has never gotten laid, and you just hate it when women have sex and you want to punish her for daring to have sex, for having the, the audacity to be a woman who has sex, right? That's how they were spinning it in the beginning. And I think if they hadn't really, really pushed that narrative on people who can see through it a little bit and who don't hate women, I, I think if, if, if Gamergate, if people in Gamergate actually hated women, they, they would not have, you would not have had the backlash from gamers over this whole narrative. Right? And the more you had a backlash from them saying, no, we don't hate women, and you guys are full of shit, the more... They pushed the, the narrative. The more the media problematized those statements, right? Okay, <laughs> by saying, you're just saying that because you hate women. Oh, jeez. Well, that's, that's sort of proof that you should never really respond to that defensively. You see, I hate women with... Oh, this is going to get totally... This is like the infiltration. I have infiltrated female culture by being conceived as an XX gamete. Yes. No. You 37. Were. No. 38 years ago. Oh, zygote. Learn the terminology. Oh, whatever. Zygote. Whatever. I have. <laughs> you were yes. Just for this moment to tell you that I hate women. That's okay, Allison. I'm. And I'm. You. I'm here to tell you, Allison. So what? <laughs> well, it's, that's that's a good point. You know, so what? But I don't actually hate women. I, if, I, if I hated women, surrounding myself with them in a radio show would probably be the stupidest thing I could have done. Probably. You know, but what was interesting out of this whole thing, of uh, going into the second half of the panels, was, yeah, Milo and Goretzky kind of gone, went back and forth, and... Uh, and with their banter, uh, Koretsky was annoying Milo, Milo was annoying Koretsky. Koretsky kept on interrupting uh, Milo, uh, Christina, and Kathy. You know, because they kept on trying to bring up why Gamergate is what it is, because it has that underlining level of the abuse, victim. Abuse of the narrative. Yeah, the yeah. abuse of the narrative. And Koretsky could say all he wants that we're not talking about that. Now, there's. Uh, I'd like to play pseudo devil's advocate for just a moment. There's two sides, two possible ways that that could be worked. Um, he, he, he could be trying to keep it strictly about what we want, which is ethics and gaming journalism and how to get it. Or he could be sitting there trying to figure out what Gamergate's strongest <coughs> argument could possibly be, <coughs> minus the uh, the supposed misogyny and victim narrative. And I don't know if that was his intention, if he was trying to draw that out by getting um, getting Milo and Christina and Kathy to to try to put it in other words. But we understand that the story of Gamergate starts with asking for the ethics and then the, sh the shit pile that came after it with all of the victim narrative and just continuing to shovel it off the truck. Um, it... it <laughs> okay, well, yeah, do you guys, well, sorry, go ahead, Ivan. 
Okay, no problem. What's going on is basically from what I've seen, since I'm not like directly into the game, the game gate kind of news. I don't know exactly, you know, who said what or what's happening. From so I can see it from sort of outsider perspective, and basically for somebody who might not know a lot about it, it looks like it's just chaos. Like from the GamerGate side, they don't have a like a what's it cohesive like message. It's about ethics in gaming, but then feminists are involved, and you know why is this guy? Why does this guy hate everybody? Like what's what's going on here? So I think um, from what's the name the uh, the moderator Kretzky. Kretzky. Yeah, Kretzky. His position was that. We can't really talk about some of the you know more core problems like with, with uh, I guess the feminism like narrative because it's too big of an issue to like kind of really tackle. I think that's a huge mistake. Yeah, I absolutely do. I think that's mm -hmm. it's it's a mistake to um, to leave the part of human nature complete that puts us in these positions completely unexamined. Right. right? That that. You know this protectiveness that we have for women and children, and our willingness to uh, believe them when they say they're in danger, and uh, and strike out at the nearest man um, who who looks like he might be up to no good. I think that we need to, this is something that absolutely needs uh, examination, and that the main problem of feminism is that it, it takes a it takes a very, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of skill to convince society that loves women but never enough, right? That it actually hates them, right? Like society feels like it could never love women enough. And therefore, it's very easy to convince society that because you don't give in to every demand, because you don't take every single complaint seriously, Right, that you are a misogynist, that you actually hate women. Which is why the narrative works. <laughs> yes. And and it's like it's like gaming gamergate is sort of feeding into the narrative by it's weird because you it's it's hard to know what to do. Fighting back directly just kinda like makes them say, See, look at you haters on women. That's right. <laughs> you know, and fighting back Indirectly, it's like, well, you guys aren't going to defend yourself, little pussies. <laughs> it's like we're just going to keep poking. Yeah, you with just this keep stick. poking you with that stick. You know? Yeah, no, it's it's essentially uh, yeah. it's essentially you're never going to look like the good guy. Um, not until it's all over. Not until it's all blown over. And even then, you'll have people saying, "I stand with Jackie," and I believe that something happened to her that night. It might not have been seven guys raping her on a pile of broken glass, and then her friends telling her. We don't think you need to go to the hospital because it'll ruin our social life. But we still believe that something happened to her, and just because she's not the perfect victim doesn't mean we should not believe what she tells us. Right? You. It, how how do you get past that? And how do you get past a society that? I mean, literally, with that story, the number of people who bought it and were horrified by it. Right? And I'm reading the thing. And she's falling through. She's fuck. Uh, the guy falls on top of her through a glass table, right? She should not have been able to walk away from that. She she should not have been able to crawl away from that. And frankly, you know, like you you think of the some of the most amazing details of that story, right? Like she's in a pile of broken glass, and these seven or nine guys or however many take turns bouncing their testicles off of broken glass to rape her rather than picking her up and moving her somewhere else, right? None of it, like, how that story got past one person who is a journalist and is supposed to have an ounce of, more than an ounce of skepticism, right? And a team of editors, right? And a whole bunch of freaking people in the media. Enough people in the media that when people, other people in the media started to question it and sort of say, hey, this kind of sounds off, right? They were called idiots. They were called misogynists. They were called horrible, horrible woman haters. You know, victim blamers. You, you know, you're not believing the victim. That's re-traumatizing, blah, blah, blah. You're going to scare women from reporting their rapes. And, you know, the backlash, the initial backlash to that, to, to the... It, 
first attempts to discredit that story was huge, right? And so how do you win in a situation, and you still have people apologizing for you, you still have people saying, well, it was Rolling Stone's fault, not Jackie's, right? Um, how do you get past, how do you, how do you fix that mentality? How do you, how, how do you do that without alerting people to the fact that they have that mentality, right? And here's Koretsky saying, well, but we're not going to talk about that because that has nothing to do with it. Well, yes, it does. If people are, are interviewing uh, Brianna Wu and Zoe Quinn and Anita Sarkeesian for ABC Nightline, and they're not interviewing Sargon of Akkad, Internet Aristocrat, you know, and uh, and a bunch of other people from the other side at the same time, and they're just taking these women's word for things, right? You know, when, when Brianna Wu says, it, it's, I hate to use the word terrorism, but it's actually terrorism. It's terrorism against women. Um, no, nothing to challenge that statement, right? Like, absolutely no challenging of that statement. And nothing from the other side. Uh, some neutral parties who sort of heard of it, right? Invited to speak, and then that's it. Story done. Let's go to press. All right. That, kinda that's kind of... That's kind of where the ethics comes in, um, and I'm actually going to relate this to the X Files. I don't know if y'all remember uh, the the office in the X Files with the poster that sat behind Fox Mulder. You know, when when you were looking at him at his desk, it says, "I want to believe." Oh, right. It's like the exact opposite of what anybody involved in genuine investigation should have in 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 their office, in their attitude, anything. And this is this is the biggest problem in journalism today. Everybody has a thing that they want to believe. And rather than investigating and finding out the facts and, and assessing what's going on and, and actually writing about the information factually and accurately, they're more interested in promoting a narrative. And that's with with ethics you have this um, you have this system that you can use to determine whether or not a person is doing that, whether they're they're acting on I want to believe or whether they're acting on I found this information out, here it is. And uh, you, you, know, you can go through and, and you know check on whether or not there is a relationship that is, is going to uh, determine the person's thought process instead of their uh, their actual seeking of information or whether they've got some other sort of conflict of interest, whether they have been involved in, like with us, where we we uh, talk about men's rights, we talk about um, gender issues, and we we publish things on our blog. We have made it clear that we're publishing from that perspective. You know, when we do, when I do my blog, I've actually got a thing on my blog that explains that I'm going from that perspective. And, and those are those are the kind of things that we need to to have instituted, and it won't necessarily matter whether at that point we're talking about a social justice narrative, a religious narrative, a right-wing political narrative, it, it all falls under the same standards. You still have to be able to uh, disclose where you're coming from and, and talk about what might be affecting your choices and your reporting and, and your conclusions that you're drawing. Um, and that's where when I, I we, there was a big discussion a while back. Um, I guess the controversy is still going on, uh, on on in the Gamergate hashtag whether we are discussing ethics and journalism or social justice, opposing the social justice invasion. And the reality is, um, you you can't do one without the other, because the majority of ethical breaches that we've had to talk about have in some way or another been related to protecting or promoting social justice narrative. But you can't just oppose the social justice justice narrative randomly without having some sort of a tool to deal with it. And the reality is the best way to prevent that kind of imposition is to have standards for ethics so that everybody has to use those same methods and everybody has to be open and honest about what they're doing uh, or, or they can get called out on it. One, one of the things that I found hilarious uh, in the afternoon was that um, Kathy Young was uh, describing, you know, how she had written the story because the, the Koreski wanted to know, 
you know, well, I mean, like, cause how did you go about writing it, you know, like, because these people are anonymous, and she says, well, okay, so I went on Twitter, and I looked up the Gamergate hashtag, and I spent a few days, you know, finding out who were the most prolific tweeters, and whose tweets were getting retweeted the most, and, and then I reached out, and, and she said she talked to this woman who's a, she works, she's a tech writer, uh, and uh, a member of, uh, of, of Gamergate, and um, she, you know, spoke to her, interviewed her, quoted her, and, and all of the rest in, in one of her stories, and he, he comes out and he says, well, I was, uh, you know, didn't you just say that, you know, did you, did you, did you ask the other side for comment? And she says, well, no, because up until then, every single mainstream story, and there were dozens of them at that point, was taking this one very, very, very similar slant on it. It's, it's all about the harass, harassing misogynistic gamers trying to chase women out of, te out, of, out of gaming. And she said, I was writing an article specifically to present the other side of the story. And I felt that in my intro, as I was describing what the story had been reported as so far, with links and, and everything, that I had given that side of the story adequate coverage, right, without having to talk to any of, you know, Anita Sarkeesian or Zoe Quinn or anyone like that. I'm, I, can re I can report and link to what they have said to other media outlets, all the other ones who have, have written about this story. I was writing from a counterpoint, and he said that that was unethical because, um, you know, according to to people, she and she finally she came back and she said, you know, like, I'm not saying that when you're writing a story from a certain position as essentially saying only half the story's been told, and now I'm going to give the other side of the story that you have to have that same. We're going to talk equally to both sides. If I had been looking at this story brand new, fresh. Of course I would have, right? But I don't need to represent that side of the story personally. I don't need to personally interview people who've been interviewed multiple times by multiple media outlets who have their stories out there in, in the press, right? I don't need to do that. I just need to link to stuff, right, that's been written about it so far and present the other side of the story. Um, I thought that that was uh, a real dick move on his part, calling her on that. Um, What's she supposed to do? What's what's she she's supposed to give equal time to people who have had all the entire freaking platform in the press, you know, on multiple news sites for months and months, and she's supposed to give equal time to them as to the other side of the story? That just doesn't make any sense. Well, coming from like uh, just playing devil's advocate a little bit, I think what he was trying to do is establish like I guess rules for ethics. That journalists have to face, and since you know, he was really criticizing uh, Milo. That's his name, right? Yes. He was really. Oh, was Milo really, really Milo yes. really got under his skin. Right, and he was really criticizing him because he was saying he asked him a direct question, like, "Okay, do you write opinion or do you write news?" Milo's like, "Well, you know, I write both." Yeah. And he's and he's like, "Well, do you you know label your your um, articles, you know, opinion, or do you look at news? Well, I'm pretty, like, I'm yeah. pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that Milo's yeah. articles on certain issues are very obviously news, and I'm pretty sure that his right. articles on other issues, like his, obviously like opinion. his review of the Mattress Girls sex tape, mm -hmm. right? Right. I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that you don't yeah. need to label that opinion to for people to know that they're reading an opinion. But essentially, what he was saying is that, well, these real journalists on the other side. You know, real journalists have to say, you know, have you know an ethical code that they can't you know do the same thing you do, whereas you just say, well, this is opinion if you think it's opinion or something like that. So yeah, I think well, it was really hard on Milo though. That, that's when I was like, oh, this he is was, well, no, Milo, Milo made a few comments right, right near the start that um, I knew got under Kretzky's skin. Uh, yeah, Panina, we really can't hear you very well, so just speak up a bit when you talk. Okay, Otter Jesus wanted to bless us with his holy words, so go ahead. Um, like earlier when you were talking about the whole the angle about how Zoe Quinn was like it was people are harassing a woman and so therefore they're evil and that was like what the journalists were going with. But I had I had brought this up before in um one of the the <laughs> nerd class 
about how um, what was it about how on Comics Alliance? I think they actually wrote a Gamers Are Dead article or something like that at one point. But Comics Alliance, it was re um, it was shown that Chris Sims, one of their writers and somebody who is now writing like something for Marvel and X Men, he had been harassing this one female comic book writer for a long time, supposedly. She had spoken out when she found out he was writing a comic. And uh, last one, I thought. And um, anyways, so Comics Alliance, as soon as they find out, they immediately start defending Chris Sims. They start defending this guy who had been harassing a woman. And it's just really fascinating how it's like, well, well, it's okay because he's a good feminist now. <laughs> well, yeah, no, no. Look at look at Thunderfoot. That Thunderfoot video, and a bunch of people were basically saying it's a low blow and it's it's you know low hanging fruit and that it, it was immature of you to put up this video, Thunderfoot. Um, and it was just a series of clips of uh, of different social justicey types uh, doing videos about how um, you know essentially, and I, it's hard to follow the story, but it's essentially. Um, one woman in social justice has said that, you know, I have seen people who go online and they denounce harassment of women, they denounce it, they like, they say the objectification of women is wrong, you know, these men, they do this, and then, then, then they're harassing me, right? And, you know, these same guys, like, what, what is going on? And, and every time I hear something like that, I think to myself, okay, if I, if I was a rapist, who would I want to be around? Who would really get my fires going? Maybe it would be a group of women who talk all the time about how terrified they are of rape, how powerful men are, how, uh, how subjugated and helpless women are, how uh, if I was ever raped, you know, like so few women report it, um, you know, I could never I can never imagine reporting a rape to the police because they'll just they just revictimize you and all of this other shit. That's like a rapist wet dream. It it is. It really is. Well, um, yeah, because she weak woman who who's and and, and all, all they talk about is rape, right? All they talk about is how oh you know and women shouldn't even be like you can't expect a woman to resist. She, you know if she women freeze they just freeze up and then they can't do anything and I'm I'm like. Okay, mm. what do you tell this guy about yourself, right? Okay, if you push me too far, I'm just going to freeze up and let you do what you're going to do, and then I'm not going to report it because I don't want to be re-victimized, really right? And you get to feel like the big powerful man, right? Like, you're victimizing me, Karen. I, I yeah, just, that's, that's really triggering. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to speak to that. Karen, I'm going to speak to that. First of all, yeah, you're right. And in particular, the, the two things that you're rightest about are the not fighting back. And I've had this discussion with, with um, uh, I, I, I guess I'm going to start calling them woman worsters. Where, uh, and that's referring to they, ha they always think that women have it worse. Women have it worse. Women have it worse. Maybe and, you're... Because it, it doesn't pull out a label, it pulls out a behavior. And it covers every single person who engages in that women worsting behavior. But when I get into arguments with women worsters, they always, like one argument with this one particular person, and not, 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 you can't necessarily extend it to all women worsters, but he was a women worster. He said, um, when, when talking about a, a preventative method, telling women that, for example, in 95% of the cases where a woman fights back, she's successful at preventing uh, rape. And he said, you can't tell that to women because those women who don't fight back will feel shamed. Yeah. So, and I said to him, so you will allow those 95% of women who would otherwise have not been raped to be raped to prevent shaming of victims. To prevent so obviously, obviously, you think that victim shaming is worse than rape because you would rather women be raped. Yeah. And, and, and it's not even, it doesn't even make sense. You're just giving preventative tips. Um, you're not actually shaming women who don't fight back because one response to trauma is to freeze. Yeah, you don't have to shame them because they froze. But I want to know, as a woman, and that you, if I fight back, I'll have a 95% chance of getting the hell away. Like, well, and, who wouldn't? And one of the biggest problems, too, with that is that a lot of police services and a lot of, uh, a lot of those types of um, individuals 
will actually recommend women not fight back because they they say that it, fighting back often leads to more severe injury. But that even that statement is an indication that the police somehow don't feel that the rape itself is an injury and a severe one. Um, who's going to get a worse sentence, right? A longer sentence? Somebody who punches a woman in the face or somebody who rapes her, right? So which is the worst injury here? Yeah. Well, right? and, yet, and yet the cops are telling these women you should you should accept the larger injury to avoid the lesser one. Okay, it's, it's a, from the statistics I've seen, apparently if women fight back, not only are they more likely to escape, yes. even if they are injured, yeah. they also get through the ordeal better because yes. they did something. And psychologically, that protects them. Even if you get through a situation where a guy attempted to rape you and you have a black eye. I've had black eyes after sparring matches. And yeah. if you had submitted, you wouldn't have had a black eye, or you wouldn't have had a sprained arm, or you wouldn't have had, or sorry, sprained wrist or sprained shoulder or whatever. I mean, the fact is, you fought the fuck back. Yeah. And that's it's it's emotionally you're protected when you do that. You get yes. over things faster when you fight. You have and a sense of agency through the through the thing, and and that that sense of agency protects you even if the rape is completed. If yes. You get back. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Psychologically, even if women sustain more injury, if they fight back, injuries fade. The psychology of the attack stays with you. So to say that that to say to prioritize not just women being raped, like you're, you're saying, okay, well, it's okay if more women get raped. It's more. It's okay if more women are traumatized because we don't shame. Well, what the hell are you? What? What is it? What is it? Your what? What? Yeah. What is it that we're always told, though? It's we're told that predators go for the weakest one, mm -hmm. and what is weaker than a prey that doesn't fight back? Yeah. Which is why rapists love feminists. <laughs> but let's 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 uh, let's this is really off topic. But I did want to okay. I, 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 and I'm gonna I'm gonna punch myself after I do this because this is also off topic. But I wanted to point something out that I noticed in a recent argument with somebody who engages in women worsting. Um, at the end of the argument, he essentially said, "If if uh, you know your your beliefs um, and who you associate with, they're bad men who are gonna hurt you." So you should drop your beliefs and, and, you know, I guess come on your side, on my side. And I pointed out that that is the kind of rhetoric, that is the kind of attitude that throughout all of human history has gotten women to comply with laws and curfews and uh, harems and restricting their movement yeah. because they're afraid of those bad men over there. So if um, someone who engages in that behavior and I would call, you know, in this case, self-identified as a feminist, is willing to say that. What what means? Why why do you think that that's not? They're not going to do that in another circumstance. Yeah. As long as you use that framing, as long as you use the framing to force women to do stuff, and this this ties back into Gamergate because of the framing is the same thing that's used to silence women in Gamergate. As long as you use that framing of Oh, those bad men are going to get you. So you need to listen to me and do what I say, or else, then you will have this pressure for women. This 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 dynamic that women will 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 accept restrictions on their own freedoms in order because of because they're afraid of those bad men over there. And we need to challenge that dynamic. And once we do, that won't happen again. But well, I, I just wanted to throw that out. Here's the horrible thing about. The, the feminist I you know uh, take on that is that it does not permit restrictions on women's freedoms right so essentially what it does is it uses the specter of those bad men over there right but it doesn't do it to get women to comply you're not allowed to make women comply you know any anymore women are women have every freedom to do whatever the fuck they want except be a gamer gator or be anti-feminist yes well there you go but um, but uh, it puts all of the onus on those men who were never dangerous, never bad, to stop being dangerous and bad. 
<laughs> but yeah, let's get back on on topic. I think. Um, so we've we've talked about uh, the individual whose name I cannot pronounce, Korzynski. That's that's not even close, is it? Just call him Krusty the Clown. No, I'm not gonna do that. That's that's mean. Oh, but, but I said oh. it's okay. He's uh, nice. Koretsky's not bad. He's Koretsky's? You know, honestly, he ain't great. He's not on our side. Um, he's not objective. He's not even in the middle. Um, but he's not bad, given the alternative. Given, you know, what we're comparing him to. He's really not bad. Well, what he did after, you know, the bomb threat kicked us out, when he tried to basically say, you know, uh, let's try to continue here so that, you know, we're not shut down by the bomb threat. Yeah. That made me think of him in a better light, though. Oh, it did, totally. And yeah. and on top of that, he, because he, we, we were all kind of uh, gathered around this old uh, condemned abandoned house. I don't think it was condemned. I think it was for sale. Yeah. Um, it had a no trespassing, no trespassing sign. It had a big no <laughs> trespassing sign on the side. But, but there was nobody there. The gate was open. It was obviously empty. And we all kind of... Ash Scow went and sat on the porch because she was tired of standing, and then we all kind of sort of started going in there, and the cops weren't doing anything. <laughs> and so he uh, he came in and he announced that okay, we're going to continue the discussion here since we're not getting back in there anytime soon, and there's no guarantee they'll let us continue when we do. So everybody, you know, let's have our panelists, the ones who are left, let's have us all assemble. In this, under this carport, and we will continue the discussion and film it. And I'm sure it's gone up on. It's there were lots of people recording. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Um, so, so he did do that. And another thing that he did um, was he allowed somebody else to take over as moderator, and that somebody happened to be the person who leaned over in the middle of the uh, morning portion of the of the panel discussion leaned over me and whispered to Oliver that all of the panelists were being doxxed in the chat. And um, so yeah, essentially um, that that guy seemed to be like a stand-up guy and uh, he took over the moderation of things, which was probably good because Gretzky was uh, he was getting a little bit obstinate by by the end of things, and uh, and that he wasn't keeping the discussion productive, and then he went and you know we had Telemundo, which is apparently the largest uh, TV news network in America, um, the Spanish speaking one, and uh, and we had. I think two other news crews. I there. saw Channel Six. Channel Six was there. Yeah, I saw. I think there were two others um, that had very professional-looking cameras that arrived after. You know. Um, oh, still giving Koretsky <coughs> credit though. Instead of it, okay, well, we're just gonna we're just gonna wait until no. They try to kick us out. They try to shut us down. Yeah, no, yeah, he's still there. He's talking. Now there was another. I I did not catch his name. But there was another journalist who joined us who was not he, he, he was observing and he was He was very listening. interested. He was very interested. He says that he was a journalist in Afghanistan and when something like this happened, the bomb threat and everything, everybody clears out. They go home, they go and find safety. With us, he says it's actually a very inspirational that we're hanging around and we're continuing the discussion regardless of whatever threat to our lives there are, or supposed threat to, to our lives. Hey, I, I saw the drone. Bullshit. You know, anytime a bomb threat comes in, we all we all know to you know it's just yeah. Yes. You hit the nail. Yeah, Antonio just made a really yeah. good jerking off motion. <laughs> um, it's it's just it's just internet wanking is all it is. And mm. Maybe, but. Well, you never so, know, yeah, right? Yeah, of course. That's what I was like. But, I mean, the chances are astronomical, and, you know, I'm willing to die. Like, every time I get in a car, I could die, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm, I'm really not that concerned. And most of the threats that happen on the Internet, um, most of the bomb threats that get called into places, probably 99% of them, probably more than 99% of them, are bogus. 
right? I mean, I, I've had three bomb threats called into schools I attended in the 1980s, right? right. Um, I had, uh, we had uh, bomb threats called into uh, places where I was working. Uh, fire alarms pulled at the mall, right? And, you know, the fire alarm goes off and everybody's just like, oh, okay. yeah, don't <laughs> worry about it. You know, the fire trucks will come and, and they'll realize nothing's happening because some asshole kid pulled the fire alarm, right? Um, th this is something that just, it, it's, it's, it's so easy to do it now. Um, it used to be you had to do it from a pay phone. Right, call in a bomb threat, or you have to actually go up to the, the thing and pull the fire alarm. Now you can, you know, make and make you you can make a, a threat online that comes from some kind of relayed through like twenty different servers and IP addresses, right? That essentially can't be tracked tracked down. You can do that now. So, like, why wouldn't people do that if they don't like what? what someone's saying. Why wouldn't people do that if they disapprove? Um, and the, the people involved in this, like I only know of one actual incident of actual physical violence um, among the people that I know, and that was Nick Redding was walking down the street one day in his neighborhood that he unfortunately lives in that's full of university students. And uh, he um, he got accosted by a uh, he was walking home from work he worked nights right got accosted by a guy on the street and they got you know he started verbally you know calling him all kinds of names and then they got into it and then the guy punched him in the face and and then Nick popped him one in the nose and broke his nose and then the cop came and uh, told them both to grow up and then went away, which is how such things should be treated, um, I think, particularly with someone like Nick. Okay. Uh, but, but, okay, but here's another thing that happened to Nick, okay? He was walking home from work one night and there was a rapist in the area known as the Garno Rapist, serially raping women. And uh, he was walking home, and he got stopped by two cops, and started being questioned as if they had gotten anonymous tips that he was the Garno rapist. And about half an hour into this into this discussion with these police officers on the sidewalk, they got a call saying that the Garno rapist had raped someone else about 20 minutes ago, uh, about a kilometer away. And that was lucky. No, 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 no. And then also, uh, they're wasting police resources. They are. Oh, they with this nonsense. They, and with the nonsense at, uh, at Airplay. They, they recommended that all of their members, the members of their feminist group, call the police and report the fact that Nick Redding was running for city council. <sighs> You, oh yes, the police need to know that. Okay, but this is this is severely off topic. I, I did want to ask. So after you guys reconvened in the empty car park, um, car, carport, uh, what did you guys? Uh, what, what what went on there? Did you did you, did people talk? Did they say stuff? What 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 occurred? Kathy Young was still there. Um, Mark Seb was still there. Ash Scow was still there. Um, the two. Uh, Two journalists and the game developer were still there. So, and uh, at one point, um, Oliver got in on the discussion as well. So, I mean, they they actually had a a good continuation of the discussion. Um, Alum and Christina and Milo, I think they just got really fed up with the heat, and their car wasn't cordoned off with everybody else's car. Yeah. yeah. Right. They had to park a ways away, I guess, because they arrived late in the day, uh, and and all of the valet parking was taken, and all of, so they parked a few blocks away, and uh, either that or they got a cab, and uh, yeah, so they they took off, and I guess they went back to their hotel or something, but um, but there were enough people there to finish 
the discussion. And they talked for, what, another about 45 minutes or an hour? Oh, you guys, 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 this just in. Hannah has called in a bomb threat. Apparently, she has placed a bomb underneath the icon of the doge. We all need to evacuate this stream. Actually, <laughs> no, I want to I wanna stay and watch what happens when that cute little motherfucker explodes. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is for real. We have to evacuate this stream. There's a Google bomb in this stream. It's going to go off at 2.45 at some place in, you know, 2.45 someplace in the world, apparently. It's set to go off. We don't know where. The, the time zone wasn't specified, but it will go off at 2.45. You know, 6.49 right now. I, I'm officially blaming a third party. <laughs> we can pinpoint the location. If we're going to wait for, for something 45, that's almost another hour, and I'm just not willing to wait that long. <laughs> So yeah, we'll probably have vacated the stream by then. Uh, unless, that's okay. we're, unless we're dealing... I'm officially blaming a third-party troll. The only bombs I'm interested in are Jaeger bombs. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay so um, just, just, to, just, to, just to get on the topic of bombs, so does anybody here think that Gamergate bomb or uh, called in the, ga the threat to AirPlay or SPJ AirPlay? AirPlay? Here's why Gamergate did not call in. <laughs> Gamergate did not call in a bomb threat. Uh, you looked at, at the the uh, earlier tweets about uh, AirPlay uh, from Gamergate. The group was celebrating having a chance to talk. They were begging for a chance to talk. They raised money to get people there to talk. They would not silence themselves. So it would be stupid for Gamergate to call in a bomb threat. There's just no way. It was about 20 minutes before the end. Well, maybe they were just, you know, it, you know, it happened really early. They may not be late riser. I mean, I heard that it was from 10 different yeah, locations were, across the country. Is that correct? There were supposedly 10 different bomb threats. From 10 different locations across the country. Oh, well, I mean, maybe we're dealing with 10 very lazy people. Like they just didn't. I mean, they're, they're not so lazy that they won't get up to make a bomb threat, but they're so lazy that the, you know, uh, it, ten o'clock Eastern time, yeah, nobody wants to be up at that time, right? Because it's like eight o'clock at night time. They 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 make a point to place in the bomb threat where the three most prominent panelists could speak. Yet they couldn't be bothered with anything in the first half where there was the most talk about journalism ethics. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they they actually targeted the three most, um, uh, I guess, media high profile of the panelists. Right. Oh, Specifically yeah. the ones talking about feminism. Yes. Oh, <laughs> oh. The, 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 the plot thickens. Well, so, I was a little bit about it, too. Uh, a little bit about it. I don't even know if she used the word feminism, but she did use the, Duke, uh, the UBA... Yes, rate sure. thing yeah, as sure. an example of you know like uh, following the narrative rather than the story. Um, so essentially, you know, like you, you sort of look at it, and I don't know, like I, I, I suppose it's possible that someone in Gamergate decided that they were going to do a false flag operation from ten different IP addresses across the country. Maybe. Um, like, you, you have to consider that, that that's, still that's a, a possibility. It's questionable, maybe, at most. Of course, of course. Well, the is. thing is, somebody with a dedication to Gamergate, somebody that actually cares about ethics and journalism, somebody that actually cares about the SJW invasion into various nerd hobbies and so on, isn't going to do something that would risk wrecking the credibility of the consumer revolt. Exactly. So if there was somebody who's involved in Gamergate, who did something like that. It's going to be one of the people who's involved for the lulls. You know, not somebody who's involved yeah. for the ethics, not somebody who's involved to protect their hobby or their profession from being completely wrecked by gender politics. It's, it's basically, you know, just somebody that's there to be a jerk. You know, and, and then there's also the possibility that it's a third-party troll like, I joke about, you know, blaming a third-party troll, but the reality is um, if anti-Gamergate called in a bomb threat, it was probably about the stupid, stupidest thing they could do. Obviously, the only thing that has blown up from this is media coverage. 
And it was just the same thing that happened. Now, they may be that stupid. I mean, <laughs> the feminists were stupid enough to get us kicked out of a out of a, a con where where that actually got us ten times or a hundred times the coverage we would have had. You know, we we had with thousands of views on. Uh, on our hangout discussions about it and everything, where we usually only get a few hundred or you know a couple thousand views, so it's possible that they're that stupid, but it would have to be somebody who is a complete idiot to to think that they were going to benefit, regardless of which side they were on. If if it's somebody that's on a side and not a third party troll, it would have to be a complete idiot that would think that their side would benefit from from this. There's a good article if you haven't read it. On the Atlantic, called um, "The Coddling of the American Mind," and if you haven't read it, you should. But it essentially describes um, something called, I think it's called defensive hostility or something like that. And um, yeah, it doesn't take any thought. It's not a thoughtful process. It's essentially, um, it's attacking anything that makes you feel uncomfortable without ever examining whether your feelings are rational and uh, and whether your actions are rational and any like honestly that article scared the fuck out of me right because all of this bullshit with trigger warnings all of this bullshit with safe spaces um, even if you did have a problem with people you know suffering trauma having PTSD the last thing you should do to help them is try to help them avoid anything that reminds them of that because it keeps them locked in their trauma, right? So essentially you have this movement where any attack outward is justified to protect the, the soft, fragile, fleshy, traumatized by microaggressions being, you know, in, you know, like they, they, they really aren't thinking rationally. This is not a rational thought process. Well, I mean, I think what you're saying is that the more vulnerable that we see these individuals being, the more we can justify uh, the most brutal aggression against people that we supposedly quote unquote threaten them. It's it's the the it's the it's like the dark side of victimhood. It's it, you, we use it to justify aggression. Yes, so you. You threaten me with your microaggressions, so now I'm going to call in a bomb threat. Yeah, um, but uh, this just in: I, I, I want to inform the, the the chat and the audience that the Doge, due to the threats that the Doge has received to his adorableness, has created a Patreon, which you can donate to at <laughs> www.patreon.com/bombgate. <laughs> And we all can, I mean, there is nothing more more adorably vulnerable than this little chibi doge. So look, look into his, deep into his eyes and ask yourself, do you really want to see this adorable creature explode horribly? I do. I think I've already do, like, come to the future. No, I really do. And if you don't want to see him die a horrible... Splattery death. If you do want to see him die a horrible splattery death, send the money to me. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to see him die. I usually get Mike, uh, Dr. Brandon or Cam, to animate the explosion of the doge just for me. And, oh, wait. With some so, really cool music So background. send your money to him and mark it exploding doge. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet the Doge is so sweet. I bet that candy will come out when he blows up. It's not viscera. It's licorice and whips. Sweet tarts. Sweet tarts and licorice whips. Because he's so adorable, he just explodes into sprinkles and sugar. And blood. No, there'll be no blood. And in fact, he'll just regenerate immediately the next second. Because he's his corn, corn his, syrup with red food coloring in it. His goodness transcends. This cuteness transcends all, all Karen. I'm very disappointed in all of you. And I have a cigarette, and I can't smoke in here. So, um, is there anything else you need to know? Because I'm, I'm yeah, I'm thinking the same thing. Because you, there's also GG in Miami to go to, right? There, Where they'll be there. 
I want to remind everybody of one thing. Um, somebody sent this to me to remind me uh, back back in October. Somebody, um, I think it was in October. Yeah, it's uh, it's a uh, 13 October 2014. Uh, the uh, the feed of Movie Bob here has uh, at Lady Fuzztail here something you should know about me. I believe there is almost no such thing as a bad tactic, only bad targets. And that's the narrative that uh, Anti Gamergate has had all along. Um, this is why, like, a lot of times they make the big deal about, oh, it's third party trolls, third party trolls. Even if it is, um, that narrative is one sided. You don't hear that from Gamergators about, you don't hear Gamergators saying, well, these people should be attacked for what they say. These people should be burnt at the stake for what they say. We, we've we been told that we should be gassed to death for what we say, that there, uh, there should be camps to send us to, that we should be raped, that we should be beaten, that bring back bullying, there are no bad targets. All those things have been said about us, which in its own way makes anti-Gamergate responsible for these types of threats even if it did not actually come from their camp. Hashtag gamer cost. Yep. <laughs> okay, all I have to do, Brian, because I'm looking at the chat, all I have to do now, and then my entire itinerary is done, is seduce Milo Yiannopoulos. I'll try to get it on camera. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and talk about it. Okay, so we're going to conclude this uh, this emergency broadcast of the Badger system, and uh, yeah, hopefully the Doge will live through the night. Uh, and if you don't want to donate to the Doge, because I don't actually think that is a is an actual patron link, you can always donate to us to help us put on this crazy shit, like sending Karen down to seduce Milo. Hey, or you could just give me money to blow up that cute little puppy there. <laughs> I uh, uh, don't give her money to go up the pumpy. It's <laughs> horrible. Give 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 it to us, and we will be less horrible with it. Like just a picture of a puppy. This, you I mean, never know. Bacon might come out. Oh shush. Well, oh, but that would be nice. But if but it, it, is it worth destroying a? Anyway, www.patreon.com/honeybadgerradio. It's viewers like you that make all of this possible. And it's wonderful, right? Like, Karen going down, watching a drone fly overhead to inspect a bomb threat in a venue that she was part of. Like, this is just, this is this is amazing shit. You want to be part of this shit, so donate. www.patreon.com slash honeybadgerradio. Um, and uh, the Hug Patrol is doing a stream later today. Um, and you can find that on uh, uh, Outer Jesus's Twitter stream, uh, Twitter uh, account, I believe, if you want to attend that. So yeah. So I run. I run every kill the doors. Kill the toes. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Okay. You guys are horrible. You're horrible people. You're you just like awful. You, it's so cute. It's so cute though. How could you want to kill it? Anyway. Good night. Well, Allison, you're the one that gathered us all together. What does that make you? But I'm not uh, to be to be. <laughs> 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 Hashtag bomb.